Okay, so I'm going to be going over due diligence, um, you know, how to properly perform due diligence on a multifamily property. Um, so first, I'm going to start with a quick little disclaimer. Um, some of the numbers I'm going to go over, uh, there's a lot of variables when purchasing multifamily, a lot of different uh, property classes, and just the numbers I'm going to present are not necessarily work in every area and every property. So just do your own due diligence um, and figure out your own estimated numbers. As far as the slides, um, I tried to pack a lot of information into these slides. So here's the link if you want to download them because I may start moving pretty quick through some of them. And I'll also give this link at the end as well. So this is what I'm going to be covering. I'll go over a little bit about myself and the two companies I own. And then I'm going to go through the whole process um, from the property tour, you know, before you have it under contract, what you should be looking for then. Give you some high level numbers you can use for your CapEx and then um, what you would actually look for when you do your property tour. Then some rough numbers you can use to come up with a better CapEx budget after you tour the property. Then what you should do for your due diligence inspection, what you should avoid um, and what you need to be looking for when you do your due diligence so you don't run into issues later on. Um, then finalizing your scope of work after your due diligence is complete. Then why a pre-construction meeting is important and then how to execute from there. And I've got a couple bonuses towards the end. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, you know, Melissa said quite a bit there. I've been doing real estate investing for, for over 13 years. Um, started in single family, did a lot of wholesales, did a lot of fix and flips, then did some smaller multifamily and some rental properties until about a little bit over three years ago, I started focusing on large syndication multifamily deals. And since then, uh, I've got 1,700, 720 doors under management, another 850 doors currently under contract. And then, um, I'm also invested passively in, in, in several properties as well. So I also opened a construction company over 10 years ago when I started to scale my single family. I realized to do quite a bit of fix and flips, it would help to have a construction company and that's um, why I started that. And my experience as far as the due diligence and the CapEx portion of it. Um, so then who's Elevate? Elevate is my real estate investment firm that we purchase multifamily properties in. Uh, like I said, we syndicate our deals and uh, we offer good returns to, to our investors. Um, and there's the team right there. And then j and Construction is my construction company and we focus on doing our own CapEx as well as other investors and managing the whole aspect of the project and taking care of everything from due diligence to executing the actual project. Here I just got a couple pictures um, showing some before and afters of some of our projects and um, just showing you the type of Transformations we, we do to these these properties. Um, there you got a, quite a bit of before and afters. We really like to get the curb appeal to pop and then, um, you know, make sure that we've got the nicest units when they walk in. And then this is just some of our, our clients, some of our multifamily clients on the construction company. And here we go. So as far as the, what I call the pre-property tour. So what does that mean? 
that means you've got a deal that is looking promising on the high level. You have not seen it. Um, and these are the questions I like to ask the broker or the seller, depending on who you're dealing with, um, before even getting out there. So some of these are pretty detailed and you may get some kickback from the broker or seller. I still ask, um, cause the more information I have, and I stress this to them, you know, the more information I have, the better offer I'm going to make, the more confident I am on what it's going to cost me to get the deferred maintenance or the upgrades I plan on doing done, you know, the better offer I can make. So I'm not going to read all of these. Um, like I said, you can get these slides, but basically I want to have details on interior units. You know, how many classics are there? How many upgraded units are there? Um, what different type of upgraded units do they have? If they have different um, levels of upgrades, definitely want to know how many down units because that can change your, your CapEx budget dramatically. Then um, a list of the CapEx they've completed. I mean, that's, that's super helpful. I want to say most um, owners should have that. I have ran into <laughs> some owners that don't have much of anything, but uh, for the most part, they should have that. And that can really help with knowing, you know, let's say the roofs were replaced two years ago. Okay, well, they should be in good shape. I'm not saying don't inspect them, but... Um, on your high level, you can probably not put replacing the roofs. And, um, you know, more questions about the plumbing, especially if there's boilers, same thing with the AC, especially if there's chillers. Um, and yeah, then you can take that information and you can kind of get an idea of what your CapEx numbers once again, on the high level would be, this is still before you've even been to the property. This is kind of when you're doing your quick underwriting, your quick and dirty, you know, is it even worth making a trip out there? Once again, little quick disclaimer, these numbers are based off of class C type properties. And once again, depending on the area, you know, it may not be like this, but uh, I would do 3000 per unit. If most of the units are, are renovated, and there's not that much deferred maintenance. Um, then 6,000 if there's several units that need to be upgraded and you've got, you've definitely got some deferred maintenance. Now that doesn't mean it's gonna cost each unit 6,000. It's not gonna cost 6,000 per unit. This is in including the deferred maintenance as well or any exterior. Plus your, your business plan may not be to do every unit. So you got to take those things into account. And then if you've got pretty bad, a property that's in pretty bad shape, um, a lot of deferred maintenance needed, several down units to 10,000 per unit. Um, you know, if you're looking at B class properties, your finish outs are going to be more expensive. You're probably going to do more to the amenities. So these numbers would have to increase, et cetera. Then I would take those numbers and I'd plug them into my high level quick and dirty underwriting. As you can see, not really sure you can see my cursor. I would think so. Um, I plug it into right here where it says CapEx per unit. So 6,500, this was one that probably had some units um, that needed to be renovated and some deferred maintenance. Then this will tell me if it's worth to go take a look at it. And if it is, then at the property tour, these are the things that I would look for. Um, as far as the landscape, you wanna see how much landscape you're gonna to have to do. Um, I like to take a lot of pictures because you can always refer back uh, when you're getting into your rough estimate numbers, which I'll, I'll show here in a second. Then uh, your exterior walls, you know, you, you want to see is the property going to need paint? Is it going to need siding repairs? Um, 
most likely you're going to have some, some carpentry you got to replace, you know, how much of that do you have to replace? Uh, once again, pictures, you know, I would get pictures of, of every single building. Then you want to take a look at your windows. What condition are they in? You know, are they single pane, double pane? Are they aluminum, vinyl? Are they falling apart? Are they in good shape? Um, you know, a lot of the times if we are doing a, um, older properties, got aluminum windows, single pane, it's not the most appealing look, but you can easily add solar screens to it and it'll change the curb appeal dr dramatically and also give you some, um, energy savings as well. So roof, you know, you want to see what, what type of roof is it? Is it flat? Is it sloped? Is it uh, shingled roof? Is it a TPO? And then dig into, you know, let's say you sent those, those questions to the broker, but you didn't get the answers back. Well, if you're prepared and you ask this to um, the onsite manager, usually they'll give you the answers. So usually I would take this checklist with me and make sure that um, I get everything answered. Then interior units, you want to try to see as many as they allow you to, you know, on a property tour, it's, it's somewhat limited, but you should be able to see all the vacant units. Um, and I would definitely stress to see the down units. You want to see how many there are, how bad they are. Like I mentioned before, that can change your CapEx quite a bit. Uh, you want to see what their classic units look like. So you know how much of an upgrade you have to do. And then take a look at what they're calling upgraded units and see what, what they've done in those units. Um, move this over. Plumbing. Uh, this is the property tour, not, the, not your actual due diligence. So really all you can do is look for the clean outs and see if they're PVC or cast iron or any other type of material. But, um, you know, sometimes it doesn't tell you everything. Sometimes the cleanouts could actually be PVC and you still have cast iron sewer lines. Um, but it'll give you an idea of what type of shape the sewer lines are in. Then as far as the boilers, take a look at it, see what it looks like, see if any of the parts look new, snap a picture of the, of the label on the unit, which if you send that to a licensed plumber or to, you know, a general contractor that's, that's used to dealing with multifamily, they can uh, give you an idea of the condition or the, not really the condition, but the age of it at least. Then same with the HVAC um, as far as the chillers. Take a good look at those, snap a picture. Uh, if you've got individual units, even if it's window units, you wanna kind of just get a feel for how many of those are older. Um, and you can tell by just looking at them really. Foundation, you wanna walk around, um, look for cracks on the exterior, look for cracks on, in the brick and, sep and separation. You know, I know here in Texas, you're going to see stress cracks for sure. Um, it's the separation that you want to see how much separation you're getting. And that will really tell you how much issues you have in the foundation. Um, same with the drywall inside the units. Um, you know, look around the windows and doors are usually the first to go. And then pay attention to the amenities what type of upgrades do you have to make to the existing ones? What amenities are you going to want to add? Uh, parking lots and walkways. Get a really rough idea of, you know, how many big potholes do you have? How many walkways uh, you're going to have to level? And if you get an idea of how much square footage, you can uh, come up with an estimate there. Then fences and gates. You know, just take a look at it, see what kind of condition it's in, see if the gates work, um, your dumpster surrounds, if you need those or need to repair those. And then 
cameras and security you know are there any on site if they are are they actually working once again that's something you can ask to the on site um or are you going to need to add some more then uh just to give you an idea here's a quick video um of me performing a property tour i'm not going to play the whole thing but here we go What type of condition they're in? It's got a, sort of a mansard style with wood single siding. So I'm going to know right off the bat that's pretty old siding. Um, as you can see, it's got some pieces that are are coming off. Um, so we'll have to All right, I'm not sure if you guys can hear this good. So place it. Go around, take a good look at the brick, check for cracks, check the foundation, see the landscape and the drainage. Um, back here, see some of the amenities. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pause it there. Um, so once again, if you get the slides, you'll you'll see the whole video, and it's me doing pretty much exactly what I just went over. Um, all right, here you've got some, some rough CapEx numbers for the interior units and then some for the exteriors. It's not every single item, but it can give you an idea of what some of these things cost. Once again, these numbers are based off of, we mostly do class C properties. Um, yeah then this is what I would put together um, after doing the property tour. So if I've taken all my notes and usually I'll, I'll do this and have, um, I've got six screens and I'll have all the pictures open and all my notes and I can probably put this together in maybe 15 minutes. Um, but this would give me, so here's a second page, a really good idea of what it's gonna cost for the CapEx. For instance, this exact property, um, our budget ended up being, I wanna say we ended up maybe 20,000 less than this after we did our due diligence. So the numbers are rough, but I mean, they can, they, it's a educated estimate. So then you've got uh, due diligence. You know, let's say you revised your, your offer and you've actually got the, the property under contract. So now it's time to perform your due diligence. Um, so I want to stress that you want to walk every unit. Um, you personally don't maybe have to walk every unit, but either the property manager or if you're hiring a due diligence inspector or if you've got a general contractor that's going to do it for you, um, I do suggest you're, you're involved and you do walk several of the units yourself and then make sure you have a good system, whether it's you or the contractor or whoever's doing it for you has a good system of um, organizing all of this. Uh, we use an app and that's where all the pictures get stored and it just, it makes the information usable versus just having it there. Um, and I say every unit because you don't want to miss any down units. I know that's, I think the third time I mentioned it, um, you know, you, you're talking about maybe spending $5,000 on, 
on a, on a unit compared to possibly 20,000 on a really bad down unit. So, so it's pretty important. Um, then like I stressed, uh, yeah, you want to make sure you're organized and efficient. A lot of pre-planning before you get out there and do your due diligence. Um, and then you want to, so there are some professionals that you want to get out there to inspect with you. So you want to make sure you have a licensed plumber that's going to scope the, the sewer lines and they're going to do a good inspection of the boilers. You want to make sure you have an HVAC company that goes out there. If you have chillers, make sure they inspect the chillers or if it's individual units that they, they take a look at it and, and give you a good report on what you have and the condition of them. Then uh, your foundation and drainage, you want to get a foundation company out there to take levels and, and give you um, an estimate of what it's going to take or if you even need repairs. Termites, you want to make sure um, you don't have any big termite issues. And then you want to get a roofing contractor out there um, to check on the roofs. I stress do not go by what the broker or seller tells you on any of these items, you know, get someone out there to look at them and inspect them. Then uh, you can also get a, a general contractor like our company, j &T, to go out there and, and manage all of this for you. Um, the most important thing there is just make sure the expectations are set on what they're going to do, what they're going to inspect, what they're going to supply you with. So I have seen a lot of companies that will do the do, due diligence for you. They'll inspect it and they'll, they'll show you what's wrong or what they found's wrong, but they won't attach any numbers to that. They won't give you any estimates. Um, and I mean, that's good information, but it's not the whole thing. You know, you want to, you want to know what your CapEx budget is going to be when you're done with your due diligence. So one other, one other mistake I've seen is don't just look at the deferred maintenance while you're doing your due diligence. Take this time to also look at what you want to upgrade and what those upgraded costs are going to be. Um, so you can have your total CapEx budget. I see some investors that just worry about the deferred maintenance but then that leaves a lot of guessing to your, to your upgrades, um, which the less guessing, the better. And then finally on the due diligence, just make sure you're involved as well. You know, even if you're going to hire a GC to do it all, or, you know, some property management companies will as well, just be very involved, be there, oversee everything. And, set the expectations in the beginning and know what you're going to be getting from each party involved. Um, this is a really quick video, so I'll probably let this one play, but this is um, an example of us at during due diligence. And you can see how, if this is not a uh, planned and organized, well, it could be mayhem, but, whoa, I'm not sure what happened there. Hold on. Let's try that again. Here we go. Yeah, so as you can see, I mean, there was, I think at one point we had maybe 30 plus people on site. Um, and there's a lot, lot going on. So here I've got um, a couple items that you do not want to miss when you're doing due, due diligence. This is the top five most common that, I, that I've seen that get overlooked. Um, the roofs, I know I mentioned it a couple of times, but not just looking at the roofs, but getting a really good idea and getting a professional up there to look at it. You know, if you got a flat roof, you want somebody to do a core sample. 
what a core sample is, is, um, sorry about that. I could have sworn I had silenced my phone. Okay. So what a core sample is to a flat roof is you actually cut into the roof and you see how many layers you have there and what your bottom, um, decking is, you know, what is the roof actually on top of, um, and that just gives you an idea of, of what you're working with. You know, if, if whether you need to rip it all off or whether the system can take an overlay, which would be less expensive, um, then there's also several things you can do with roofing to, to save some money. You know, if it's, um, you could do some fluid applied or, there's a ton of different roofing systems. So just make sure you're working with somebody that, that is uh, familiar with working with investors and multifamily. Then you've got your exterior walls and balconies and walkways. So you want to take a close look at this, especially if it's, if it's stucco, you want somebody to that's familiar working with stucco to go take a look and make sure that it's not ho holding moisture. And I don't know, we've worked on several projects where we've literally had to come in and tear all the stucco out and redo it because it was not flashed properly and water was getting underneath and causing a lot of damage. Same with the siding, you know, when you're looking at the exterior walls, the bottom line is don't just assume it needs paint, you know, really get into the covering, whether it's stucco, siding, brick, whatever it is, and um, figure out the condition of that. Then with the balconies and walkways, just pay close attention to the structural piece of it, whether they're going to need extra support or not. Uh, sewer lines, like I mentioned, you want to scope all your sewer lines. Um, you know, there are some issues with doing this. Some of the times you're going to run into sewer lines that have a bunch of built up grease and without jetting the lines, you won't really be able to see all the issues by putting a camera down there. You know, at that point, there's not really much you can do. Hopefully there's, there's some lines that you can take a good look at and that, and then use that as an average of what you might be dealing with. Um, you're not going to go in and pay to have the lines jetted one. You don't own the property yet. And then there's liability that come, that can come with that, but um, definitely get them scoped. You want to know, you know, if you're dealing with PVC or cast iron or whatever it may be, um, if you're dealing with PVC a whole lot better. Um, if not, you probably want to budget a little bit more in your in your plumbing then you've got your foundation and drainage these do go hand in hand um, I will tell you from experience some foundation companies only do foundation and so the issue with this is if you lift your foundation you fix your foundation but you don't touch the underlining issue which is either going to be poor drainage or a plumbing leak underneath. Those are the two most likely issues. Um, then you're just going to pay to have the foundation lifted and it's going to years down the line, it's going to have the same issues. Um, cause you didn't fix what was causing it. Uh, so if the foundation company you're having go out there is not, um, won't do drainage, then you want to make sure you get a company that specializes in drainage to take a look. And then the last thing is termites. Just get an inspector out there to look for, for termite damage, um, to look for active termites. Uh, last thing you want to do is find out you've got to replace a bunch of framing uh, because you had termite damage. So then the final piece is, I think I'm, I probably need to speed up a little bit. Um, 
Final thing is uh, putting it all together, right? So you, you, you're done with your due diligence. You had all these uh, crews go out there. You've got all this information. Now you need to take the time and put it together. Um, either the owners or if you hired a general contractor that's going to help you do that. But you want to finalize your scope of work and your budget ideally before your due diligence ends. So, you know, if, if, if you came across any major issues during your due diligence, obviously you want to get that in front of the seller. And if you've got to uh, renegotiate the price, um, you know, retrade, I don't, I, I wouldn't retrade unless it's really necessary. You know, if you run into a bunch of plumbing issues or, you know, the seller told you the roofs were two years, two years old and you got up there and yeah, they're two years old, but they were overlaid over the worst roof anybody's ever seen. And it's not going to last. Um, then you want to have, like I said, the, the full scope of work, including your, your deferred maintenance, your updates, everything. What, what's it going to cost? So then you can go and you can, update your underwriting and make sure everything still looks good before you move forward with the deal. Um, okay. Then the pre-construction meeting. So, you know, let's say you're a couple weeks out from closing now, um, or even a month from closing. So this is where I see the ball get dropped a lot. You know, the, the investors get past the due diligence and then, Usually it's because they're, they're very wrapped up in, in raising the equity, which I completely understand, but it's valuable time that can be used to get everybody on the same page. Um, and that way you can start your business plan and your CapEx right away when you close on the property. Uh, so what we do is we, we set up a pre-construction meeting and it's going to have the general contractor there. It's going to have ownership. Um, property manager and anybody else that's essential to, to getting the CapEx completed. We're going to sit down like you see here. This is one of our, our pre-construction meetings and we're going to go through the full scope of work, make sure that everybody's on the same exact page. We're going to go through, I don't know if you can see there, but there's some finish outs, some carpet and paint colors. We're going to go through all the finish outs, make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, we're going to go through expectations, you know, who, what are we going to get on a weekly basis? What are we going to get on a monthly basis? How, how are change orders going to be handled? How's our um, progress going to be handled? How are we going to, what are we going to do with interior units? Who's going to track it? Um, et cetera. Then this way you can be ready. You know, usually we like to give the, property management company a week, maybe two weeks, depending on the property that we're taking over to, to really get situated and um, just be ready for us to start on the CapEx. Other than that, you know, after the, after we give them that time, we're, we're going hundred um, percent to get the project completed in a timely manner. Then this is one of the bonuses um, is how do you hire a contractor? You know, what's the, the proper way of doing this? So one, you want to hire somebody reputable, you know, um, you want to make sure that they, they specialize in multifamily, uh, multifamily and single family are completely different. <laughs> um, you know, the numbers are a lot bigger with multifamily, but it's also, you've got to be able to have access to more manpower. You've got to be able to deal with those bigger numbers um, as a contractor and your accounting has got to be a little more on point versus a contractor that mostly deals with single family, um, you know, online presence. There's no reason why a contractor should not have a good online presence or any presence at all online. Um, if they don't, that's a huge red flag. So definitely look for Google reviews, face, 
uh, social media, et cetera. Um, references, definitely ask for references and definitely call them. Um, you'd be surprised. I know I've called references before and they don't always tell you nice things. Um, case studies, you know, if they've, they should be able to give you some case studies, some projects that they're currently working on. Um, we always invite our, our clients or future clients to come look at a project that we're working on and, and see how we work. Uh, they definitely need to have insurance. Um, and you want to make sure, you know, I would say a minimum of 1 million general liability. Um, and then you want to make sure they put the LLC that owns the property on the certificate of insurance as additionally insured. This just makes it a lot easier if there is an issue and you need to file a claim that you can. Um, and then credentials, you know, there's, it speaks a lot when a, when a company has credentials, some of these associations, it's not the easiest to be a part of down here. I gave you an example of our accredita accreditation credentials, sorry. Um, and a lot of the associations do a lot of vetting before they accept anyone. So the next thing, so let's say, okay, you're convinced you're dealing with a reputable contractor. Then it's a time to ask questions. You know, I, I don't see this happen a lot, but last thing you want to do is get into a large project and not know what's going on. Um, not have a clear scope of work. That's, that's just a nightmare. It's a injustice to your investors and to the project itself. So one is the scope of work. You want to make sure you have a detailed scope of work and that everybody knows what's going on and that every detail is put into that scope. Then material wise, you know, if they're including materials for you, okay, well, you don't want to just leave it up to them to pick what materials and you're going to want to see, you want to make sure they either they show you the, the exact product they're going to be putting in, or they give you an allowance of how much each faucet or each light fixture um, is budgeted. Then the communication piece. So this is very important. You know, what do they use software? Do they, do they have a project management software that's going to keep us up to date and is going to um, give us progress reports is going to show pictures and videos. Um, if not, then how do, what do they do? Do they send a weekly report? Um, is it just a conversation? You know, the, the more, the better as far as communication, obviously uh, we find that, using our project management software is great because everybody stays on the same page. Everybody sees what's, what's happening. Uh, we do our schedules within there. We do our reports within there and it, it, it works really well. Change orders. You don't want to be slammed with change orders. You want to have a clear process of what does that look like? The last thing you want is a contractor that thinks, they can just do change orders and then submit an invoice and no approval process. So um, project completion. Yeah. So you want to make sure you have a procedure for closing out the project. Um, what that looks like, what does it look like as far as a punch list and you know, how, how does that happen? And then you want to make sure to get, clear understanding of what type of warranties you're going to be getting from manufacturers, if any, and then as far as labor from the contractor. I want to leave some time here for questions. So let me kind of go through this quickly. Just some uh, other good tips for multifamily investors. Uh, what should property owners, so some, some value adds to the properties that you can do. Um, Obviously adding more units is going to increase your NOI. Uh, we've taken several storage units and turned them into um, 
extra units as well as office space. Uh, adding character to the property. So we, we add a lot of cedar to, to our projects. We put them on the, on the balconies or you can even add them onto the brick. It just gives it that pop and changes the curb appeal of the property. And then, you know, obviously depending on what class of property you're dealing with, the more you can add as far as technology, the better. Um, and little things that just little custom things, you know, putting USB instead of just putting a regular plug, putting a plug that's got USB ports as well. As far as affordable amenities to add to a property, uh, dog parks are, are really easy to put in. As far as the fence, if you make it a, you can make it a pretty simple fence and then the equipments don't cost too much. Uh, barbecue slash sitting areas. We do a lot of that somewhat inexpensive and then um, repurpose some office space. Yeah. Sometimes we run into, you know, these massive office spaces that leasing office that um, can be turned easily into a business center or um, a work share space. Then as far as the interior unit renovations, um, a couple things here. If you're gonna be doing new countertops, the difference between a stone countertop and a Formica is not that big of a difference. I would say go with the stone. Um, as far as plugs and switches, you know, replacing all of those, it gives the it gives it a fresher look when you walk into the units. And they actually sell plates that go over the plugs and switches where you don't even have to get into replacing the plugs and switches. We've been using those quite a bit. Um, they cost more, but less labor. And then some quick things, you know, dr dramatically changing the curb appeal, obviously painting the exterior, uh, full rebrand. If you're going to be changing the name, changing out all, all the signs, uh, ceiling, if you've got as asphalt, sealing the parking lot and then restriping solar screen, solar screens, like I mentioned before, and then, um, doing some nice landscape. This is an example of some of the, um, common areas that we've fixed up. Uh, I remember this one here was, um, it wasn't all open like this. We knocked out had like a loft area and then some walls. We knocked it all out, wrapped this fireplace in some really nice tile. And as soon as you walk in, boom, it pops. One thing we've been doing, I don't have a picture here, but um, when you walk into our leasing offices, we pick the first direct wall that you see and we wrap it with wood. And then we put, uh, we brand it with the property name. Um, and we've gotten some really good feedback on that. Then systems, I think systems are very important. I stress that a lot. Um, the more software and systems are in place, the easier it is to, to scale and to make sure that things get done the way they should. So I know as far as our construction company and also our real estate firm, we, use a lot of um, different softwares and systems to, to make sure that happens. As far as our subs and vendors on the construction company, they go through some extensive vetting on the front end um, to make sure we're working with good, good crews. Then, as, like I said, on technology, you know, we use a lot of different builder trend is our, our project management software. And then we review you know, this is more for commercial, but it's, it's plans. You know, sometimes you do have plans with multifamily if you're um, messing with the floor plan. Um, and then pro S is just our estimating software. And then we're all about team. I mean, in multifamily more than any other industry, it's very difficult to get done without a team. Um, I think no matter who you're, 
you're using your, you have to make sure your property manager and your contractors are all working together and they're all on the same page um, as well as the ownership as well. You know, they, they, everybody's got the same goal here. Um, and we all just need to make sure we're going the same direction. I've seen it where property managers battling with the contractor and it, it just doesn't help. Um, and then this is, uh, how you can reach me. Um, you know, if you want to know more about investing in multifamily, you've got my information right here, my direct number, my email, uh, website. If you go to uh, elevatecig.com, you'll see we've got a couple different uh, free eBooks, one on the benefits of, of investing in multifamily and some other items um, all over social media on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Uh, whether you search my name or you search my, my company name, you're going to find us on there. We try to put out really good, useful content. Um, and then as far as my construction company, you've got the email here this is our office number. You've got our website that we can, you can check out and same thing with social media. We're on all the different platforms. Like I mentioned before, here's the link to, um, download these slides. So make sure to check that out. And then Melissa, I don't know where the questions are at. Um, yeah. Do you, can you see the Q and a box? Um, if not, I can read them out to you. Yep. I see it, but I don't see, oh, unless there's no questions. I've got four questions in here. I'll go ahead and read them to you. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I don't see it. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if you've an answered this, these already because some of them have been sitting here, but what is the name of the app that you were, that you use for capturing pictures and notes? So for due diligence, we use um, Happy Co. They're not the cheapest, but it is the easiest user friendly. Um, and then depending on if you use a contractor to help you, like uh, we get a discounted rate because we, we put so much volume through it. So yeah. Um, Jake is asking what would be the best way to find multifamily focused GCs like yourself in a given city? Best ways are um, if you've got any local, well, one would be reaching out to other investors. If you know other investors in the area um, and asking them, that's probably the best way. Then you could also visit um, apartment associations. If you visit their website um, or become a member, you can um, get contractors that way. All right. Um... How much do you charge for per unit inspection? On due diligence. So it's a great question. It, it depends because um, there's, there's different levels that we offer. Um, anywhere from as little as $15 per unit to uh, 45 or so um, if they want to go ahead and send me an email um, I can dig in a little bit more on that and get them a better answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everyone make sure you get um, Jorge's contact on the screen there. I did post um, the link to the slides in the chat box just so everyone can copy and paste that if you would like. Um, let's see. Does your construction company work only in Dallas? No. So we, as far as multifamily, we do all of Texas, all of Oklahoma, and depending on the project, I'm open to, to other areas. Um, and then Steve is asking, what do you use for project scheduling, timelines, et cetera? So that we use um, Builder Trend. Um, we've also used Red Team, but um, I think we're going to be going back to builder trend. So. All right. Um, Mike is asking, do you typically renovate units when the tenant is occupying them? And if they stay, 
long term, how do you get the unit completed? Yeah, so we, we've got different techniques we've used in those instances. Um, one, we like to offer different packages to our existing tenants, meaning we'll give them, for instance, um, replace all their countertops and flooring, and then they agree to, let's say, a $50 rent bump. Um, and then we'll come in and we'll, usually that we can easily work around um, without having to get them out of the unit. Or we'll offer something, you know, replace all the light and plumbing fixtures for $75 rent bump or some, something like that. Um, so items that we don't need to necessarily get them out of there to do and then get that rent bump and, and get a new lease in place. We can also, depending on the occupancy, you know, if the occupancy is pretty high and we're having trouble getting units to, to upgrade, um, we'll offer the existing tenants an upgraded unit and have them move into that upgraded unit and then upgrade their unit and kind of do it that way. Um, Wayne is asking, do you recommend getting multiple GC bids? How many do you think is optimal? Yes. Um, you want to be yes or no. So you want, you want to be careful not to burn some contractors out. You know, if, if you're constantly getting bids from contractors and you're not giving them the work, you know, eventually they're going to stop coming out and giving you an estimate. So I would say at least two. And then if you find one that works really well with you, I would say probably stick with them um, and just come up with a way to, you know, make sure they're staying true with their numbers and not overcharging you. Can you talk about your start in multifamily? What size, what's next and your growth over time? Yeah. Um, so the first unit we did, or the first property we did was a smaller one. It was 37 units. Um, I don't suggest doing anything under hundred units, or maybe 80 at the smallest. Um, the reason I say that it just, it takes a lot more time and effort on the smaller ones. Um, you know, I did learn a lot from it though. Um, so since then, our sweet spot seemed to be like the 200 unit. And then we actually teamed up with a larger group um, and started helping them find deals and helping them complete their, their CapEx and um, their focus is portfolios. So at that point we started looking at 800 plus units. Um, as far as where I see in the future, you know, I'm, I'm, trying to get to 10,000 units as, as soon as possible um, and start vertically integrating more um, aspects of the, of the business because that way you have more control. Dwayne's asking, do you have a, a suggestion in how to work with a property manager on DD effort? Yeah, I mean, I think, once again, expectations, like, make sure you get with them and, and find out, okay, well, how are you going to track everything? How are you going to track the units? How are you going to track um, simple thing as, as pictures or what, what repairs are needed? Um, I think they're a great asset to, to use, especially on the, the unit walks. You just got to make sure you're all on the same page. Um, and let them know what your what do you consider an appliance that should be replaced or same thing with the light fixtures you know what do you plan on replacing on the light fixtures or the plumbing fixtures so that when they go in and the inspect the units it's actual information that you can then turn around and use for your capex budget 
I would not suggest, I guess it depends on the property manager, but some property managers aren't so built for the construction aspect of it. So I would suggest using a GC for that part of it versus a property manager. When I say that, I mean, um, you know, all the exterior stuff and the deferred maintenance and those items. So um, the next question is, how do you deal with no warranty on any of the work that was done on the property and owner cannot find any papers for it? The owner, meaning the, the seller, I take it. Um, so if the seller got work done and they have none of the warranty information, um, you should be finding that out during due diligence. So you need to make sure you take that into account. Yeah, you've got um, your roofs completed last year, but you have literally no warranty on it. Um, so in your mind, you've got to take into account, well, I may have to cover something if it comes up. So make sure you get whatever that is in inspected by somebody during your due diligence and then just take it into account that there's no warranty. The next question is, do you do in-unit washer dryer installation? Um, it depends. I mean, if, if, if um, the area is calling for it and it makes sense as far as what we're going to have to do to plumb for that, um, the cost to get the plumbing and the rent bump makes sense, then, then yeah, definitely. All right, we have time for one more question um, from Theodore. It says, do you have any suggestions on the team building, size and nature of team, steps on the path of acquiring a 100 unit property? The building the team, is that? Yeah, do you have any suggestions on the team building steps on the path of acquiring a 100 unit property? Next. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll try to answer, I think what they're asking there is, um, you know, you got to make sure you have every aspect covered. So if, if it's just you and you're not good at raising equity or you've never raised equity, well, you want to make sure you have somebody on your team that has that experience and can bring that to the table. Um, if you can raise equity, but you have no idea how to find a deal, well, make sure you have somebody on your team that can locate deals and negotiate them. Um, so pretty much putting the pieces together, making sure you can, you have someone on your team that, that can locate deals, somebody that can supply the money to get it done, somebody with the net worth or li liquidity to get a, a loan on that. Um, and then somebody that can execute once you close on it, that has either asset management experience, construction experience, all those kind of things. Great. Well, we are right at the time now. Um, thank you so much, Jorge. That was um, a great session. Thank um, you, Melissa.